place without limits or judgment. A place for you and people like you to tell your most effed up stories. Everybody and welcome to another episode of Effed Up Stories. I am your host, Will Pender. And I am your co-host, Ryan Sharp. And tonight we will again be speaking with Chad Hawkins. We had him uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, uh, when we discussed his encounter with the Men in Black. And uh, that episode was uh, received very well. And of course, he has a story tonight for us about his experience with uh, a demon or an exorcism. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, I want to kind of line up something with you guys. Uh, Ryan and I are going to try and get you guys, um, you know, anyone we can find with uh, content for our future stories that we're planning or future podcasts so we can get some, uh, you know, possible guests for our show. Something that we've, you know, been thinking about is, you know, while you're asleep and you're unconscious, some people have, you know, they have precognitive dreams, uh, people are open to suggestion, hypnosis, uh, different words can act as triggers for people to remember certain events that they didn't even really know that they had. So this got us curious, and, uh, you know, we talk a lot about UFOs, demons, the men in black, and all of these different things, and we thought, could any of what we talk about act as a trigger for an event that you've had that you don't know you've had? So we want to try an experiment, and we want to run this for at least a month so that we can get some feedback from some people. But what we want you to do is listen to one of our podcast playlists. We have season one, season two, and a couple other playlists. So go to sleep listening to that. And, uh, you know, hopefully some of these words or things that we talk about will act as a trigger. And if you experienced any flashbacks or especially strange or precognitive dreams, we want to hear it. Uh, your experience could end up being in our future podcast. And again, if you... Uh, on a side note, if you have any effed up stories of your own on the paranormal, we want to hear that too. So you can go to our official site at www.effedupstories.com. That's E F F E D U P S T O R I E S dot com. Go to the menu, go to submissions, fill it to form, submit it, and that again could end up in a podcast. So, with all that having been said, uh, welcome back, Chad, to the show. Hey, Will, Ryan, how you guys doing? We're doing well, I'm doing well. I'm, I'm I'm doing just fine. Okay, so Chad, cool. before we jump into your new story, I'm just kind of curious as a follow-up to our last episode, did anything ever come of, you know, we were talking about the men in black, did you ever get any, uh, you know, I guess, uh, red flags since then from the men in black? Um, I thought I thought I did. Uh, I chalked it up to, I chalked it up to an experience However, I was told otherwise because I'd been at a birthday party uh, that same day and I'd been drinking a little bit, so I I confused it. As far as I know, um, I haven't uh, had any any uh, whiplash, I guess you call it, from uh, from that podcast. You know, I've gotten the feeling I might have, but nothing I can uh, say is substantial. Okay, fair enough. And there is, may I address something real quick with yeah. the fans out there? 
Yeah. All right. Um, to all to all the fans out there, uh, I do appreciate the emails, the the Facebook messages, the messages on YouTube. However, please stop emailing me to let me know if there's people commenting saying that they either don't believe me or they have a hard time believing me because to anybody that's ever going to do a podcast like this, like the one I did last time, you, you cannot share such stories like this and expect everybody to believe you. Otherwise, you're going to be nothing but disappointed and pissed off. Yeah. I went into it. I went into it knowing not everybody's going to believe me or have a hard time. I know one of the questions I didn't understand and was a little vague. That was my bad. Please don't email me about those kind of comments. I'm well aware. <laughs> that, that kind of goes uh, part and parcel with this content. We we get our share of uh, you know weird weird things like that too. But I mean, yeah. It, it is what it is, right? That's like people when they drop in. It's like, by the way, your show sucks, and it's like, well, you know, who gives a fuck what you think? You know, <laughs> we have, but, but, yeah, well, we have our yeah, subscribers, well, I, we have reviews. Like, it really doesn't. Your opinion don't matter, <laughs> right? But anyway, that being said, it, we yeah, know who it, we know who the show is for. To people who like it and appreciate, it, and that's why we do it. Um, so let's get on to your story. With uh, it was an exorcism. Uh, it's one of the few that I have been a part of, yes. And actually, you and Ryan get to participate in a tiebreaker today. Okay. Because uh, the ones that, because like I said, I've been a part of a couple of exorcisms. Now, the one that, like, I've, I've gotten a lot from some of the people I've emailed, and we're at a time right now if you're wanting me to go on about uh, an exorcism from a person or a building. Or a building. Uh, sometimes they'll just do an exorcism of a particular place oh, to I get, get a, whatever's there. I so get you what want to have the exorcism of the person or just the ex- or exercising the ghost from, from the place. Well, what's a more interesting story? That's the one we want. <laughs> uh, they're both they're both pretty uh <laughs> they're both pretty effed up for me, but you just answered well, that why, one. Bill. Why don't we start with the exorcism of the person, and if uh, time permitting, we'll uh, maybe touch on the uh, exorcism of the building. Well, wait now. He was just about to say that I answered it in some way, right? Oh, well, well, uh, I was saying. What I was trying to say, Will, is you gave me the answer I was hoping for. Okay. You both, you both have broken the tie. It's unanimous now. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right, let's go with that. Uh, well, uh, just to want to give a little history on how this all occurred. Um, long before I was into, you know, before I started researching UFOs and and those damn men in black, um, I've always uh, I've always been into, you know, studying the paranormal, what I call the true paranormal, the the ghosts, the spirits, the demons, poltergeists. Uh, you know, back when I was nine years old, I began to is when I I got dropped on my head, had a concussion. And I began to see uh, like outlines, misshapes, and people that weren't there. And I began to hear them. I could see them, and I could feel when they were around. Like I knew, I, even to this day, I can still do it. And I can, and I always know when there's more than just set amount of people uh, in the room. So I began to study all of that. I uh, met up with my friend, my former friend Leon, uh, when I was visiting Tombstone, Arizona. The premise of that very inaccurate movie with Kurt Russell and Val Kilmer, uh, and we we got talking and we formed uh, with some of his friends uh, a paranormal research group. We weren't very big because we were not technologically advanced. You can't ex- you can't expect a bunch of beginners to to be advanced like that. Uh, so we were doing an investigation at a house in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, it was me, Leon, uh, his friend Cynthia, and her girlfriend Lisa. Now, what ended up happening uh, while we were investigating this house? Uh, Leon got scratched with, and there were three scratches on his shirt. They were like under his shirt. They were bleeding. And anybody that knows, for those that don't, I'll go into this a little bit. If that's all right. Uh, the th- when you get scratched three times by an entity, you're taunting. Uh, that's usually mocking the Triquatra or known as the Trinity, uh, mocking the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Leon was great at antagonizing. You know, they, you, you see, 
you seen that god awful ghost hunter show you seen ghost adventures right guys you uh, see them yeah, they started yeah. yeah they started antagonizing and that Leon yeah, was very good at it he was actually excited he was a devout catholic um, i got scratched too on the back of my calf i was like okay i'm not going to provoke this thing no more that's enough for me i may be a pagan but Shit, that's enough for me right there. <laughs> yeah, let, let someone else take the, you know, the heat, right? Uh, exactly, and we, and me and Cynthia were even saying, I wouldn't, I wouldn't provoke this thing, Leon. Look, we have proof it's a demon because it just gave us three. Because a ghost, a ghost won't really, they'll let you know they're there, but in different ways. So do spirits. So he, he was all excited, and uh, he began provoking. He got another three scratches right on his chest. And then, we, then the poltergeist activity began and things were flying off the wall at both of us. And uh, as a matter of fact, Lisa got hit by something that came flying and that, it, you know, well, that was scary all in its own. Uh, and we got a lot of interesting EVPs talking in language, talking in a language I didn't know. Uh, I had, I do believe it was Latin. I don't speak Latin, but we had, we had good evidence. This house was haunted. Not long after, uh, Leon began acting very not like himself. Uh, he like, he was very irritable. Uh, he was growing pale. He wouldn't wear his crucifix anymore. Like he wanted nothing to do with religion, which was very not like him. Uh, because I, from the day I met him, and Cynthia and Lisa, they said that he was a, you know, he was a big church goer. Uh, he, you know, always praying. He wanted nothing to do with these things. He didn't even want to do investigations anymore. Now, just a quick question about um, his taunting. <clears throat> At yeah. any point, um, it did, you know, did he invite it? Uh, to to attack him or invite it to him in any way? Yeah, he, as a matter of fact, he did. As soon as like he saw scratches on himself, he goes, "Look, it was hurts." He's like, "This really hurts," but look, he's like, "It got me." I said, "That's three of them." You're aware that that means it's a demon. It's mocking. It's mocking the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he's like, "I bet you wouldn't do that again." He's like, "Come to me." He's like, come, come to a firm believer in the Lord. I dare you to do it again. You don't have it in you. I'm a holy person. And that was a big he mistake. Was wrong. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a big mistake. Uh, Actually, his it, change in mannerisms and stuff like that is very, very, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's like textbook uh, when people get possessed. You know, like it, because it's not always like this sudden. Okay, well now I'm I'm possessed and I'm a completely different person. It usually, is a gradual. Uh, thing that happens over a bit of time, and people do realize, uh, you know, these subtle changes to extreme uh, changes over time and behavior. It it is. It's a whoa. You guys, all right? Oh yeah. All right. Because uh, yeah, it was a it it was a gradual and uh, not very subtle transition. It was it was notice it was a very noticeable one, though at the same time. Uh, I kind of dropped the ball on my end of the team because, you know, I'm supposed I'm the, I was the guy who was supposed to ask the questions, you know, the businesses or the places. When did this start? I dropped the ball because I didn't push enough to find out the truth on the house that we were investigating. Because uh, where kind of where I kind of started wondering because at the time I didn't know, you know, I thought possession was all Hollywood and shit, and. When I asked a question, I finally went back to the people. I said, the, your house, we investigated. I need to know what the hell happened. When did this start? They finally came out and said, we played with a Ouija board. And that's when everything started. That often yeah. is how it comes, hey, the Ouija board. Because just by using it, yeah. you're, you're inviting it, right? Because th that's uh, your... Ouija boards and seances that aren't done properly. Yeah. Because, you know, I've... I've done seances, but if you do it properly, you know you don't run the, you don't run this risk. And uh, these people said they were playing with a Ouija board, and I was raised 
you know, I was raised Mormon. My dad hated Ouija boards. Ouija boards were evil. And, did, and I, I saw why. I saw why Ouija boards were evil. And, you know, just the investigation alone, the investigation alone with the, with the poltergeist activity, which usually coincides with demons, you know, that was enough right there with shit flying off the walls and, you know, shit coming off the tables and flying at me. <laughs> It's like, oh boy. <laughs> so, uh, with with the way he, the way Leon was acting, like I said, you know, started getting pale, wanted nothing to do with church, his crucifixes, and the the worst change we saw in him was when we came when we came one day and said, "You're not acting like yourself." You know, he looked like he was half dead, and then I was I was like, "I heard you haven't been to church either, dude. What's going on?" and I tried to hand him. I tried to hand him his Bible and said, "You want to do some Bible study with Cynthia while me and Lisa go over some more evidence from our investigation." And he he like aimed the shot with precision. He smacked that Bible. His it was his Bible. He smacked it out of my hand and right into his fireplace. Wow. And that's he would never ever do that. Me and Cynthia got very. Uh, we got very you know not only discouraged but very worried about what was going on. Apparently he, from what Lisa said, while he was sleeping, he started chanting like just in the, in a language she didn't know. And apparently he looked at, he looked at her at one point and in, and in Latin, he, he called her a, like some, by some kind of name that uh, translated into a, into a blasphemous whore. And that's, he'd never, ever talk like that. If you knew Leon, he never talked like that. So, and uh, just a quick question. How long at this point, uh, had you known Leon for? Um, I do by this point, I'd already known Leon for the better part of two years. I'd met him. I had met him in tombstone, uh, in about 2002. By this point, we were already into 2000. Uh, we we're, were about into 2003 uh, when this started happening, and I knew him pretty well because we spent like that entire time talking always about ghosts, spirits, other you know other paranormal, other paranormal things we believed in, experiences, and uh, and then we spent the rest of the time trying to figure out how to get an investigation team together and and how to get big. So, yeah. Ch- Chad, uh, I you know just to kind of get a an idea of what it was like for you um you know as someone like i mean you weren't a big religious person at this time right you said you were pagan but i mean you're not like a uh i mean would you say you were really into like a really religious person or just you know you you had some beliefs uh for for me i i've always yeah you know, i always had the you know the pagan beliefs but i always had the beliefs my parents raised me up with not the super religious ones, but, uh, but enough to, but enough to know, uh, what, you know, what would get mocked, you know, by the, by the paranormal. Cause I studied the paranormal intensely since I was 10 years old. Uh, so it's just, I would, I had to I had the beliefs, but I wasn't a big religious person, but so, I'm always open to everybody's belief. So Chad, when you saw your friend, and like I mean, he's obviously uh, not normal at this point, and and probably at that point you had you know the idea in your head that you know he the possibility that he is in fact becoming possessed. I mean, where do you turn? I mean, where do you, like I, I'm trying to think like if my friend were showing symptoms like of you know of that nature, like who the hell would I go to? It's like do you just go to a priest? Because I feel like if I went to a priest here. Nobody would take me serious at all, nor do I believe that they would have the knowledge to deal with it. Like, I mean, what's going through your head when this happens? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going to offend anybody with this answer, but I did what every dumbass does and took him to a doctor. Well, I mean, that's it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, you really don't know how you'd react until you're in the situation. Yeah, right? it took him exactly. Because I'd never dealt with anything like this before, and we took we took him to a doctor, and just the way he was acting, he terrified the doctor, and 
then uh, when we when we got like he like he just he wanted out he wanted out of the sun he wanted back he wanted in the dark and when I you know I finally looked at him and I and I said you know you're not you're not acting like yourself now uh, who the hell are you you're not you're not Leon I got grabbed very hard by the shoulder hard enough to drop me to my knees and like I. Again, I don't speak Latin, but the translation in Latin, uh, it was uh, it was Leon. I've sent Leon back to where it is I'm from, and I'm not making it my point to bring you next. Basically, the the best translation in in more words than fewer is, and I was like, that's definitely not like him. And poltergeist activity occurred at the same time. Uh, with things being knocked off the table, he talked to me with such intensity and a very empty look in his eyes. And how did the doctor respond? Uh, when the when, when that occurred with me, that was after we'd already gotten him home. When we had him at the doctor, the doctor said we might we might need to send him to our psychiatric unit and have him observed. And it's just he started acting so aggressively. The doctor decided, no, just get him out of here, get him out of here, take him home, or I'm calling the cops. So we took him home because he became very threatening towards the doctor. And where I where I realized something is definitely demonic was because it wasn't until he saw the doctor's crucifix that he started freaking out. So he. he- Definitely had an aversion to uh, everything, I guess, uh, representative of, you know, holy, you know, the holy cross. Uh, even my, even my pinnacle. Yeah. So any, anything, I guess, that was uh, at all um, not, you know, pr- uh, promoting of whatever the demon was <laughs> like. Yeah. You know. the, like when he had me by the shoulder, his voice changed too. you know, he kind of had a bit of a. Guy yeah, had a bit of a higher voice, and this voice was very, very deep. When he had me by the shoulder, he even called me, even like uh, in, in plain English, called me a, a piece of shit person of the Celts. Says pagans go back to Celts, and it's like he doesn't know that. He wants to know nothing about paganism. We're friends because of our mutual beliefs. It's like this is it's like he. This is not anything he'd know. So did his, uh, you know, I mean, change in behavior, like, have you seen any reaction, I guess, between him and his uh, close family or friends, or was he more of a, you know, was it was it just you and that girl that was close to him, or, you know, was there other people, what were their thoughts, kind of a thing? Uh, it was when his brother came to check on him, and his brother was starting to become a priest, and he started shunning his own brother who he was closer to than anybody. And is when he, is when me and Cynthia and her girlfriend, Lisa start talking to his brother. We said, this isn't like Leon. He said, I should know. I grew up with him all my life. He's never, he's never been one to cast me out of his house or approach me in such a threatening manner or mock me the way he was. Cause he got very, he started mocking his brother and, the, and started mocking the fact a very, it was a very personal thing. The other time our song got fired up, if you mentioned his dad, Leon did not become a very nice person, even when he wasn't possessed. But he even when he started mocking his brother, mocking their religion, uh, it's just it's it, he mocked his father and the fact that their dad was dead. What What's interesting is that um, when it comes to uh, Geez, I just had a thought. <laughs> it's like gone out of my head. Um, sorry, go on. It'll come back to me. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, like I, because we were there when that was going on, and when I started saying this isn't like you, he said you don't. He said you, the man you knew is is gone, and we're like, well, who are you? And he refused to tell us, and things started lifting off the table, and a very like most uncomfortable feeling ever. It's like just thinking about it would make me rather deal with the men in black than ever deal with this again. Well, it does. And, yeah, sorry, go on. Uh, go ahead. What were you saying? No, I was just going to say that, like, uh, at least for me, I mean, of all the negative entities that there are, 
I mean, none really get scarier or darker than when you're talking demons and Satan. Oh. I mean, that that is the ultimate, you know, of dark and negativity. Um, and, and speaking of which, I, I do remember what I was going to say. Um, it, it seems like a lot of religious people, well, not a lot, but like when it comes to possession stories and stuff like that, religious people are often a target. Uh, and I think part of that comes from the fact that, uh, you know, demons would look at religious people as a threat. And plus, they already have like a, a large reserve of hate uh, towards people who are religious. So, I mean, the, you know, he went in there with kind of like a, uh, you know, he was religious, which was very obvious. Uh, it, it, you know, he was stating that and how powerful and, you know, I'm one of God's people kind of a thing. I mean, that would really, really, I mean, you, t- I mean, you said he antagonized uh, the demon, but I mean, that would yeah. really, really aggravate. Uh, well, the, the spiritual war is real between, you know, the the evil spirits and the good spirits or the demons and the angels or the whatever and the whatever, then, you know, it, 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 declaring that you are of the opposite side and challenging uh, what, you know, we could probably term a, a foot soldier or agent of the dark side. Right. Um, you know, that, that's, that's going to definitely uh, single you out amongst the other 7 billion humans here. <laughs> and, and on that note, uh, people who challenge, and not just demons, but ghosts, or I should say poltergeists uh, for the most part, every time I've ever read or heard a story where somebody challenges, you know, like uh, maybe a, a family's haunted and they're like, you know, the husband will go off one night and be like, you know, you get out of my house or I'll do this and I'll do that and threatens the, the poltergeist or the demon. It never ends well. I mean, you don't even know what you're dealing with. Uh, I, I, I can understand where the frustration, the anger comes from, but threatening it is never a good idea because oh, I, it's yeah. always capable of doing, like, how do you fight something you can't see, right? I mean, some people turn to religion, yeah, blah, 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 but oftentimes, uh, it's not enough. You need to, even if you're going to use religion, if it's something, a big deal, you're going to need to go to a priest or someone who's like very knowledgeable and experienced with... Uh, they're, yeah, the people that are coined demonologists. Yeah, and they don't ever come out and, and, and say like, well, I dare you to do this. They never come with an ego because they know it's going to be a struggle. You know, like they, they, they come cautious. You know, even... That's a, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, they come cautious even with their experience and their knowledge. Uh, you know, they never come like, well, screw you, fucking Satan. I'm going to, you know, cast you out with this and with God's name and throw my crucifix at your face. Like, it, it just never uh, happens like that because they know. I mean, there, people die. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that people don't realize. People die during exorcisms. It's not, That's true. yeah, it's not always like, okay, well, we cast it out, now you're okay. I mean, sometimes people die. It's, it's a big, big deal uh, to have an exorcism. It, it really is. And, uh, you know, like I said, after having, after seeing things, I started seeing when I was nine and started studying when I was 10 all about ghosts, spirits, demons, poltergeists. Uh, that's one thing I'll mention when we were on that, when we were on that initial investigation like i got the feeling something very very bad was in that house and when i saw the when i saw the mocking of the of the trinity as when i said i wouldn't i wouldn't provoke this thing leon don't do it It it's like because i i got i had the feeling i could see like black masses everywhere and i was like don't i was like i wouldn't do this man we shouldn't we are inexperienced don't do it i never once provoked a ghost I didn't provoke a spirit, a demon. I because I grew up basically in a haunted house. We, my family and I, we knew something else was there. And my dad always said, "Just ignore it. If you ignore it, it will ignore you. It might play tricks on us, but don't go calling it out." It's some of the best advice he ever gave me. You know, yeah. I'll make contact. Like if I hear knocking, I'll knock back, just to see if it, just see if and how many times it'll knock back. So I've been in houses. That I, I'll I'll knock twice. It knocks back three times. I'm done. It's like okay, you win. <laughs> There's you're, that number three again, right? Exactly. And so, 
sometimes it's just the warning. Sometimes, usually the knocking, that's how they let you know they're there. They knock back three times, that's their warning. You fuck with me, I will fuck everything up for you. And to, to elaborate more on a question you asked me earlier, too, but before this possession of Leon, I wasn't a believer in hell. Okay. Uh, after after I started, after the way he took me down to my knees, just grabbing my shoulder, the poltergeist activity took place around him. And when he started, when he started, you know, mocking the church, mocking the Celts, you know, my faith and started threatening his brother and, and said that I'll, I'll take your soul in place of your father's. Yeah. I began to believe in hell. So he said, I'll take your soul in place of your father's. Yeah, their father uh, their father was a man was a man of the cloth and he and their their father passed away from bladder cancer. And yet when Leon started turning on his brother, he had said he, he had said, I I will take your soul in place of your father's and I will take it with me. So what was he in fact like saying like you know, he'll take him to hell? Yes. Okay, so by that, you know, by the way that he said that, did that imply that his father was already there? Is that? No, I, I, I think that was his way of saying your dad went to heaven, but I'll take you in his stead. Oh, okay. I I'll take you. you to hell in his stead. Okay. And that was scary enough for me that we all we backed out. We backed out of the house, and when Leon, when Leon's brother David was holding was holding his crucifix up, Leon stood back and just kept mocking. He just kept mocking David. Mocking and mocking him. So, and, go ahead. Go ahead, Will. No, <laughs> I was just going to ask, like, you know, his brother being, uh, you know, studying, studying to be a priest, I, I believe you said. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, did, did he have... Any knowledge on this? Was there anything he tried, or was he just kind of he, baffled? At first, he at first he was angry. He was very angry and was like, "Why would he ever say that about our dad?" I was like, "I don't think it's him. You need to calm down." He went from being you know pissed off to being upset. I said, "I don't think that's Leon in there. I don't think that's him talking." Here's what we did, and he, and here's what he did which apparently David had no knowledge of because, you know, they, you know, Leon wasn't your typical Catholic because David wouldn't talk, would never talk to or acknowledge uh, Cynthia or Lisa because, because they were in a relationship. You know, he thought it was blasphemous and thought it was blasphemous that Leon would even associate with them or myself. Mm. Yeah. You know, or, and the fact that he, you know, the fact that he was an event, a paranormal investigator, he hid that from, he hid that from David because, you know, what, you know, what son of a man of the cloth is going to be going and delving in such things? Yeah. But yeah. David, David realized I was right that he must, he's pro it's not him. And I said, I did, I think he is possessed. We need to do something. And he said, well, I don't know what what you want me to do. I'm not authorized to do exorcisms. And that's where I learned that, hey, you know, it's tricky to get an exorcism done. To me, it's ridiculous. You have to go, if you're Jewish, you have to have the, the council has to agree to do it, which they touched on in the movie, The Possession. That's a very real process right there. Yeah, I, uh, I've heard of that. Um, so in this case, I mean, he was Catholic, I think you said. Yeah, and... He is Catholic, and not only do you have to get a priest, apparently the Vatican has to approve the exorcism. Wow. And Interestingly enough, uh, very recently, I do believe I read a, a, a short article detailing that the Pope uh, uh, just uh, uh, released or, or allowed a, um, a new, uh, 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 I guess, hiring of a bunch of, of exorcists, a whole team of exorcists that they've, you know, official ones that they've uh, established and uh, set forth. So um, is that to say that it, it's such, you know, um, I guess common now that, you know, you know, we need to hire more staff. There's, there's that many people 
possess well, these days? Well, yeah, it was kind of. I, I it, that that kind of seems to be the feeling that it, it's been a long time since the Vatican, as far as I know, has made any public, uh, um, uh, you know, declaration of any kind about demons. And uh, oh, yeah. So, so, so is that like a sign of the end times? Like, you know, we're, we're ramping up here because we're getting close to the end. You know, the spiritual war, the great Armageddon. Um, I've I've heard a little bit about what Ryan's talking about. I, you know, I've obviously been very busy lately, uh, but I've heard a little bit about that. I'm still reading more into it. Uh, but if that's the case, I think it's because he's trying to help the church look better. Because if you really look at um, exorcisms and how Hollywoodized they've become, you only ever get the bad publicity on the exorcisms. Uh, these people died during an exorcism authorized by the church. You know, they've done this, they've done that. You don't hear about the good points of it. This person got helped, that person got helped. All you hear is this person died and these these priests that did it, they're renegades, the Vatican didn't approve this, yada yada. I think it, part- it could partially be a ramp up for the, you know, for the possible end of the world that's supposed to have happened six times already. Or <laughs> Yeah. When's the date moved be, to now? I wonder. Like it, it was 2012 forever. Now it's. I I could I couldn't tell you. I, I, I think our next one is. is actually supposed to be an asteroid. <laughs> really? Because I thought it was zombies. Is that what? Yeah, yeah that's well. a pretty popular uh, <laughs> niche right now. You know, we've played lots of games to, to learn how to survive the zombie apocalypse. So. We'll be uh, yeah, that, well prepared now. <laughs> it, interestingly, a lot, a lot of that stems from a very real um, disease called, uh, I think it's uh, like Kuru, um, and it's it it came from a, a group of uh, uh, natives, cannibalistic natives in uh, Papua New Guinea. Not to get too far off track there. I believe that sounds it's, really uh, familiar. It, yeah, it lists, well, that's the, 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 the uh, uh, dead island. Um, but that's, that's real. That's where prion disease and they think bad cow disease actually came from was, uh, when they shipped it over for study. Anywho, um, I believe we were, we were discussing how you actually found, uh, an exorcist for your friend. Cause I, we, I, I could imagine that be a very difficult process. Uh, it, it was, it was a difficult process, uh, when, when we tried to initially get a priest uh, David had gone, uh, had gone there. They said absolutely not, since uh, Leon had no interest in becoming a priest. And be and this and I was actually I actually was there when we were at, right after Leon was given the official answer. And I said, "Well, what?" When I said, "What's the verdict, David?" Or sorry, when David given the answer about Leon, not Leon giving the answer. My bad. But uh, uh, when David was given the official answer, they, uh, he came out and said, well, here's what it is. Because of the, because of the three of you and the nonsense you, that you brought him into, they're not going to do it. You're going to find someone else. Well, which that took a whole other process. It took us a few more months. And in that time, Leon was just getting worse and worse. And... Uh, right when I was like, right when we were giving up hope, Cynthia found somebody, a man I've never heard of. I only met him the few times that we, because it wasn't just the one exorcism that he did. It was it was a couple of them, but the worst the worst of them is the one that I'm talking of as I want to talk about today. Uh, this man's name was Darren Childs. I uh, I met him when he came to do the exorcism initially when he came to see Leon. When I first met him, my only contacts with him were during the exorcisms. I don't know what happened to him afterward. All Cynthia said was uh, that that Mr. Child's daughter died and he disappeared. I've never been able to find anything on him, but he knew what he was doing because I wanted to meet this man. And he went over the whole process of of exorcism. He said it's not like it's not like the movies say it's not just going to be one and done. He's like, and he said it's going to be a very, a very terrifying process. You need to know this. So we we listened to him carefully, and I said, so 
you're not of the church? He said, no. Well, why should a group of men determine the fate of one person based on their beliefs? I believe that anybody that needs to be relieved of an oppressive demon or spirit should be granted the right to have such things done. And you know, it shouldn't be up. Yeah, I think it's disgusting that priests who are really, you know, supposed to be living like, you know, the best of their ability, you know, to be good people and stuff like, I think it's disgusting that they would turn away people and need like that. You know, where's, where's that phrase, you know, uh, what would Jesus do? Well, I'm pretty damn sure Jesus wouldn't turn people away if they had the ability to help someone, regardless of how that they got into the mess. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, exactly. And that, you know, that as I'll just get to this point now, cause I was going to talk about it in the aftermath of the exorcisms. Uh, David did leave the church over this. David, was that, uh, was that the older brother or? Yes. Yeah. David was, David is Leon's, Leon's the one that got, that got possessed. David was his brother who started to become a priest. Yeah, I, I could see that. I could see how he'd be pissed off. David left the church over it when they asked him why. He said, because one of your children was in need, and you turned him away just because of the people that that he chose to to have in his life based on, per, based on a personal decision and things beyond their control. You turned away my brother. Now I turn away from the church. Yep. And you know what? He's probably holier than the priest that he was studying to be a part of. Anyway, uh, he he is actually David. Uh, David is is a, now actually a devout pagan, such as myself. Uh, he's he actually became a. Uh, I guess he's what you consider a priest, because we do we do have those depending on what on the structure of your beliefs. He's now he's now a priest within within paganism, and he's a very very spiritual and very enlightened person. Well, you know, it's it's all intention, right? You know, if, if your intention is to help people f- for the sake of helping them, well, you know, that that is, you know, that's exactly what it's about, to be a good person. But, I mean, to help only yeah. when yeah. it c- conveniences you or, you know, to not help just because, I mean, that that's the opposite, you know? Exactly, and that that's what was, that's, that's where I immediately after I met Darren Childs, I had said, okay, I'm with the. I said, I'm with this man. What do we got to do now? And like Darren, Darren was an ordained minister. He showed us his credentials. They were legit. So when we said, what do we do now? He said, well, first I need to see the possessed. And from there, you're going to shut up and you're going to do what I tell you. There are no arguments on that. As soon as we went to Leon's and, and like we got and we got inside immediately he just freaked out as soon as Darren walked in Darren began speaking to him in Latin and that Leon backed up and continued to mock him started mocking started mocking this this minister and started mocking me when I was telling him we're here we're here to try and help Leon he you know he looked at me he looked at me with just these cold empty eyes and said you can't help Leon you can't help yourself. And, you know, just this voice that I couldn't even mimic if I tried. Just this very deep, eerie voice that sends chills up and down every bone in your body. Uh, and it took all of us when when the minister said, get him in a chair. Uh, cliche, but he said, get him in a chair. So it took all of us to wrestle a 160-pound guy down into a chair. It took me, it took Cynthia, Lisa, and David to get him in a chair just to get him into it. Hold him down and strapping him in, that, that was a whole nother fight. That was about another 25-minute fight to get him strapped because he was fighting and screaming and screeching and taking very personal shots. And... Was there the any evidence that he was, uh, um, you know, that he had information that he shouldn't have had, you know, when he was taking these quote unquote personal shots? You know, was he recalling information that uh, 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 Leon shouldn't have had access to? 
he uh, he did. He did. Like one, like uh, one of the things, one of the things that he that he had looked right at, like he looked right at Cynthia, and his, and he had said, "You said, you know, you, uh, you're trying to help uh, help your friend who shuns unwanted children." At that time, no one knew that Cynthia was adopted. Yeah, Leon didn't know. I didn't know. Yeah, no, no one there knew. I'm not even sure if Lisa knew about it, because that was something that was a very, very touchy subject for Cynthia. That uh, when she was born and left at a fire station. Wow, so that must have hit her hard then. It did, and it another took one of the- those textbook, um, you know, uh, like you said earlier, those those textbook things that uh, really bespeak uh, actual possession and not just, uh, um, you know, the claim of mental illness. Well, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, my, you know, me, I know, I know a lot about, I know a lot about mental illness. Uh, my, my brother is, is epileptic. He's also severely bipolar. I have a bipolar uncle and I, for, you know, one of my jobs, I did transportation for behavioral health center. So I've seen a lot of it, but I mean, this was a, a that job was years later. But when I think back to this possession, it, you know, there's just so many, so many differences that, you know, there's no justifying it to mental illness and it's whole, you know, with this whole thing. Yeah, Cause like, as soon as Cynthia looked at him, I was like, what? She's like, how do you know that? And I was like, don't, you know, we had to keep telling her, don't listen to it. Don't listen to him. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, uh, the minister almost kicked her out of the, out of the exorcism. He kept saying, you need to stop listening. That is not Leon. And he, and he continued to ask who, who are you? And when he has said, and when he has said, you know, in the name of the father, the son, the Holy spirit, you reveal yourself now. And, it was just, it was just, fuck your God. What kind of man would send a, would send his only son to die for people that don't care? And it's like, okay, this, uh, that right there, once again, shocked me. I'd never, I'd never experienced this. I'd never been a part of it. I'd only seen movies. So this whole thing was a new, oh God, sorry. They just, <laughs> The hair stands up just talking about it. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, I mean uh, it's one thing to uh, watch it, you know, and and, and I mean to, to be fair, I mean Hollywood, you know, they they do have some things right, but I mean, uh, you know, the original Exorcist was based on a true story, right? I mean that that wasn't uh, thought up in Hollywood. I'm sure you know there were touches and stuff like that, but I mean it was uh, based on a real story. Um, that's cor- that's correct. Uh, uh, they're all based. I think they're all based on real stories. Even probably the scariest possession movie I've ever seen, which was, believe it or not, for me, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Okay. Yeah, that was based on a true story as well. Uh, for me, for me, that one and the possession are probably the most uh, accurate portrayals I that I've seen. So it, it is. Uh you know, it, 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 what you think you see in the movie is fiction, is actually uh, a, a lot of times, like in these cases, pretty damn close to the truth, right? Now, I don't know about That's correct. I don't know about you guys, but you know, it's it's a, it's an interest of mine anyway. Uh, and I've I've gone and looked up what are allegedly, uh, you know, genuine. Uh, possessed people being exercised and stuff like that. In fact, there's there's this uh, one video where they had this special desk that they would strap people into. And man, you would have to be one hell of an actor to give off the performances of the people that are, are you know being exercised because the way that they scream and act, it, it's actually scary sounding. It's, it's really scary to hear it. It's so aggressive and so... Um, 
you know, I mean, you don't even see it in the movies. Like, they can try, and they could be great actors, but they just don't get it like that. I mean, it's terrifying to no. hear it. There's, and then when you take into account the um, number of these exorcisms that have ended uh, in the, the death, or in some cases, multiple deaths, um, you know, like you mentioned, uh, the exorcism of Emily Rose, and you know the the actual story is a story of of, of a young woman named Annalise Mitchell. Um, That's correct. And she died. Uh, at, she died. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, I I think it really uh, uh, undertones the the seriousness of the the spiritual strain that's involved here and it's you know sure people have mental episodes that uh may even resemble some of these uh you know some of the characteristics but you know it's not very often that during the the you know speaking words and uh just just the process of restraining somebody and presenting religious iconog uh, iconography uh, doesn't generally uh, uh, cause the death of, of of people. So there's there's obviously another mechanism going on here, you know, and that's what we're referring to as the 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 spiritual strain involved in banishing a, a an evil spirit or entity. Well, I have one question for you guys, though, before we continue with the story. If a person is killed during an exorcism, do you think it's just, you know, their body's dead and their spirit's gone to heaven? Or is, or is their spirit trapped? Are they actually gone to hell? Well, my personal take on it would be that, you know, uh, traditionally, anyway, when you're dealing with uh, demonic possession, it, and and really the only information that, that you have to go off of, of is whatever the evil spirit is saying. Um, and, you know, it's it, the general held lore's everything that comes out of their mouth is a lie. So, you know, they tell you, of course, that your loved ones are in hell or that the 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 uh, oh, original occupant is now in hell. But, you know, if the lore is to be believed, that's all a, all a lie. Well, they don't lie uh, about everything. They, they seem to know some personal stuff. They, you know. they can. Uh, I believe when it's demonic possession, they, they can know a lot just by who they, just by who they look at. Sometimes I think too they, that they can stare into your soul and know your dirtiest secrets. Uh, but when it comes to, I think when if a person dies while possessed by a demon or potentially possessed by the devil, I think that they your soul's held captive in hell. And that's the, that's a scary kind of conclusion that I kind of lean towards. I mean, they got you right they're in you they you know you're somewhere but it's almost like they have you and i mean even people who have uh, near death experiences some people who aren't bad um you know they end up in a hellish like place and like they may be saved by jesus if they bag down there but it's not right away so maybe uh, may yeah so maybe they can be saved oh uh, for me you know also for me you know i can, my beliefs are a tad bit different considering that i'm a pagan uh but you know, I, 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 but one of the things I do believe is that if your, if your soul isn't just taken to hell, if they really want to be evil, they can put you in purgatory, which is the ghosts and spirits that we see here walking amongst the living, the what you call a routine haunting, where yeah. it's just the same thing over and over again, aimlessly. Residual haunting. Yes, the residual haunting. Uh, I believe that those are the souls lost in purgatory. That if they don't decide to take you to hell when you die while possessed, they'll put you there. And, you know, hey, come get them now because they're not up there. They're not down here. How are you going to yeah, go find them? Yeah, they so, the, the very well could be. So, yeah. so I mean, you're, you're in this exorcism. Uh, yeah. The, what, uh, was it Cynthia? I th yeah, I think it was <laughs> Cynthia. Said, I mean, she was almost kicked out, you know. Yeah, she um, was because she was listening. She was listening and letting it get to her. And, uh, and the minister, Darren Childs, was getting, was getting fed up with it because he said, if you're not going to listen to me, you're not going to do what I'm telling you, you're going to let it get to you, it's just going to come and possess you. And that's a, yet another possession. He said, it's another exorcism we're going to have to do to get this possession out of you. So you need to listen to what I am telling you. He was very knowledgeable, more than a lot of things that I had looked into because he is where a lot of priests I've met who've done exorcisms will say, no, once it's, once it's gone, it's banished. Uh, Minister Darren Childs said, no, 
if you're not going to listen to to what I tell you, you're not going to do what I say, it can jump into you. It will possess you because they they don't just they don't just banish as easily as you like to think. So that that was a that had been a new take on that for me, but. You know, you know, it's very likely a lot of people don't stop to think who's who the hell know, has known a demon to give in so easily. Well, casting it out perhaps is not the, you know, casting it out, I guess, isn't banishing it back to wherever it came from. That's step one, separating it from the from the host. Um, you know, I, I suppose if there's another uh, um, receptacle that uh, has been sufficiently uh, uh, corrupted or whatever the process is, um, provide an opportunity for the, the now disembodied demon to enter a different host. But Yeah, uh, and, that was, and that was another thing that he had taken note of uh, while, he was get, while he was getting, after we had gotten Leon into the chair and he started looking around, he saw, you know, he saw, he saw a lot of scratchings in the furniture, you know, three, three scratchings in the furniture, drawings, and just like things that were written down. So he knew that, that so Darren knew that this, this was definitely a demon just by things that were written, scratched, drawn the, the way that Leon was acting. And he had asked, he, he'd asked were other children or anybody mentally disabled in the domicile. It's like, no, Leon lives alone. Why? He, uh, he said, because, before I do this, I need to make sure because children and the mentally disabled are more susceptible to possessions than you think. The innocents are always the ones that can get possessed. Hmm. And that's why you hear so many children, you know, children are, they say are the most receptive to, to the other side because they're innocents. They're, they haven't had the chance to be corrupted yet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so he, that's why you don't ever hear about the, that's why you hear a lot about them being possessed. But you don't hear about them being there during the exorcism. So what, what method did he use to perform the exorcism? Uh, when he, for, when he, when he began, he began by first, we all had to follow him in prayer. We had to stand around Leon, uh, hold down the chair, and follow him in prayer. And then he said, stay, stay in this, stay praying repeat it over and over again uh, and he be, then he began with he began um, with putting the crucifix his crucifix to Leon and we were hearing Leon yelling and screaming and he started calling it out he started demanding to know a name he wanted this name and he wanted it now uh, and he wasn't getting it so he continued uh I, like I, I want to say probably the prayer of absolution or the prayer of exorcism, the reading from reading from a Bible, and then and then he began then he began another prayer saying that he, that the demon was forgiven for possessing uh, for possessing a child of God, which that just really pissed him off because that's where we start seeing more shit flying across the room. And I know because I got nailed and had to quickly go right back to following the original prayer. He began splashing the holy water, you know, a lot, a lot of the same processes, but done a little bit differently. And then he eventually took chalk and drew a crucifix under the under the chair, like on the like across the floor, reaching underneath the chair. This was a different from any process I've ever seen. Yeah, I've never but, heard that either. But it was working, and because I asked him, "What are you doing?" He said, "By draw, he said by drawing the symbol of the Lord, <clears throat> and then blessing this ground right here." He said, "Now it's going to be more receptive to tell me who it is, so I can cast it out and banish it." Now that it's sitting, it was technically a, uh, I guess, a blessed ground, is what he said. And it seemed to be working because it's because Leon's focus went from us. And pissing all of us off to trying to piss off the minister who was just kind of like ignoring it despite all the personal shots. He continued doing, he just continued reading from his Bible, continued doing the prayer, 
splash in the water, demanding silence. And it was working. It was working. Uh, that's why I found the process, this process so interesting. Because it was begin, is beginning to work. Because he kept saying, move, move, me, uh, move me from this spot. Yeah, move me from this spot. Uh, like, uh, I'll leave if you move me from this spot. Yeah, so it was getting to him. It was. Because it wasn't just that he drew it, it's that he is that he blessed the spot where he put where he put the cross at. And uh, then there was a there was a point where where he is where after everything stopped flying around, he stopped for a moment, I said, Are we done? He said, For now. We'll pick up again soon. He said, But we have to give the vessel time to re time to re- recuperate. Uh, so that's that's interesting. It's not. It wasn't like a a one shot go. Uh, no, as I said earlier, it wasn't just a one and done. It took a it took a couple of it took a couple of them. But Darren Darren had told me when we were, you know, while he stayed in the room and we brought him water, and I, and I said, "You're giving the vessel time to recuperate." He said, "Yes." He said, "If we put too much strain now." We may either lose Leon, he can't fight his way back. When I start calling him back to us, we can also kill the human body. We don't want to do that. He said that's what those cockamamie, uh, he called them uh, cockamamie uh, cloth wearing sissies. He said okay. that's what, he said <laughs> that's what uh, those cockamamie cloth wearing sissies of the church, he said that's what they keep doing wrong. They just want it out. They want it out now at any cost. But Darren cares for the person and the and the vessel. I say he was a brilliant. He's a brilliant man, and knew what he really knew what he was doing. He didn't when when I met him, he was in his he's in his mid thirties and said he'd been studying uh, the process of exorcism for the better part of twenty years. So he got started really young learning how exorcisms work. I'm glad there's people still, you know, doing that because I mean, it's a rare, it would be a rare skill to have. And so, so important for, uh, you know, the people who are unfortunate enough to have this happen to them. And he, and and one of the things Darren had said too, was that he's done so many, he's done so many exorcisms and that, it's so hard to teach people the process of doing it the way he does it because not everybody has the heart for it or they're not mentally or spiritually capable of, of doing it. He said, cause you don't just do one in your life. You do, you do many and you have to get into the state where you can ignore it when it starts coming at you and stay in focus and not everybody's capable of it. Yeah, I, I could see breaking down in the middle of that. You know, I mean, there's everybody's got a limit, right? Trying to, to keep that up without, um, you know, just exhausting yourself. Oh, I know I can't do it because when, before we when we were getting ready to get started again, we were coming back into where we were standing. Cynthia was a mess, just a mess. And then uh, at the time, my grandmother was just recently diagnosed with, she had just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And when I came back and I said, don't worry, Leon, we'll get you back soon. Yeah, he, had looked, he looked at me and he had looked at me and said, really? You want, he's like, you want to bring him back? Don't you know he's responsible for your dear Nana being sick? Yeah, that, Never before had it taken me so, so much to keep from wailing on him. Because that is one of the touchiest subjects for me. And of course, that's probably what it wanted you to do. Because it doesn't care what happens to the host, right? Not at all. Exactly. And and like I, I just remember holding back and I've got, I've got Darren looking at me like just give me this glare wonder what I'm going to do. And all I did was just slam, like just slam my hands on the chair. And I said, don't worry, you're going home. 
it was that was probably one of the hardest times to restrain myself ever because I had to remember it's not Leon. Lee, it's not Leon saying this. Uh, we we began the process again once everybody calmed down, got into a yeah, you know, got you know, got done with their cigarettes like I did. I I had to smoke a lot of cigarettes that day. I did before. <laughs> It was before I quit smoking too, um, and, you know, and Lisa was getting riled up because Cynthia's all upset, and we're all blaming ourselves, which wasn't doing any favors for this for this process. We're blaming ourselves, you know. Oh, I should have pressed the homeowners more, and Cynthia, you know, well, I should have, I should have spoken up, you know. Lisa blaming herself. David was there. He's blaming himself for everything, and we all got yelled at by uh, by the minister. You know, you need to stop doing this. You're not helping. We're not going to get anywhere or get him back playing the blame game. Uh, when we started again, it, we all had to go back into the prayer. Things started flying at us, ran, not as often, but randomly and it came time for the calling out process this was probably the scariest part of the whole thing i was trying to hold down this chair staying staying in a prayer having to believe this prayer while this thing is screaming and screeching very deafening into your ears because it's fighting not one to be called out because it, it doesn't want to give its name. And eventually, I remember hearing Darren Childs saying, Silence! He said, In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy, and the Holy Spirit. He, he said, the, the victors over Satan, who are you? And the name, I can never forget. Because his eyes, his eyes once again went like, oh, I guess, ominous and very cold, very empty. And he looked up and he said, Orthon. Orthon. I looked in that name. Orthon is a minor demon known for possessing bodies. His job is to possess, is to possess the person that could, is a person that's considered weak and then therefore try and bring forth more demons to possess this person and release the armies of hell. Sounds like an interesting demon to research on Google. <laughs> uh, I never looked too much into it because I just remember hearing that name and wanting, just wanting him gone and wanting nothing more to do with it. I, I, that's all I know about Orthon. That's all I care to know about Orthon. It's one of those things where you see something like this and you just, you, you don't want to know any more about it. You really, really don't. I, that's true. I got a different, you know, I mean, I get to do it from the safety of my home on the internet. Yeah. You know, very different when you're there and you're looking at it. But then again, there is something to be said for having a psychic link to, uh, you know, different demons. I remember that was one of the big things Ryan warned me about. Uh, when we had fooled around with some of this stuff, um, you know, cause uh, even having a psychic link opens up doors, right? Yeah, I listened to your podcast again about that, so I know a little bit about I know about about you know your guys' past and such things, and all the terrible things Ryan pod- did to me. <laughs> <laughs> Can't know. be as bad, or or all the things that his that his buddy did. <laughs> I forget that guy's name, but oh, that that guy was a piece of work. Yeah, that but that guy, you know, well, I don't know how, how those things played out, but I mean, it was I don't know the whole thing. Like that whole period of my life is so dark. Uh, I try not to think. I can kind of look back now and kind of, you know talk about it and kind of you know not get too you know but i mean that that whole period of my life i mean was black for me and i mean you know what the funny thing is like when i when i think about my own 
you know, paranormal touches into things, my own like half a dozen experiences or whatever it is I have, to me they seem, you know, they were big deals to me when they happened. They seem so small compared to everyone else we have on our show. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, what was a big deal to me is like someone else is like, you know, well, I'm glad that shit never happened to me. Um, but, you know, just right. while on the topic, actually, I, I'll tell you something that, that also happened to me that sounds like nothing. It's not going to sound like anything to anyone else, but it really freaked me out at the time. Uh, I was living in Stephenville at the time, and, uh, you know, me and my wife, my then girlfriend, uh, we bought this previously viewed, you know, the, the newer version of The Exorcist, right? Yeah. The, the longer, possibly more boring version. The and, director's cut. Yeah, and while well, it wasn't the original, it like had different actors and. Um, oh yeah, the remake. Yeah. yeah, and and anyway, I mean, there there was nothing really like scary, I guess, about the movie. I mean, it was really long and drawn out. I don't know what it was about it, but we had started watching this, uh, you know, one night, and I don't know, like halfway through or so, or or like an hour, hour and a half, I don't know, something like that. I got very very overwhelmingly hot like i mean like like almost passing out overheated to the point that Brittany had to um that's my now wife uh she got like this big punch bowl full of of you know ice water like literally ice in it and water and i was just like uh lying on the bed while she just like used a cloth to constantly pour this over me to try and cool me down like i was so i was too hot to talk i i couldn't even move and Shit. and i was like that for an hour and like you know i i wouldn't have thought anything of it except for the fact i was watching a movie to do with you know um you know this satanic material and like even now like i mean i can't draw a, c a conclusion to that i mean i can i can chalk it up to a, a strange coincidence but, like, it still freaks me out to think about it because, I mean, I was too hot to move. I mean, it, and it was so sudden, and I was like it for, like, an hour. I mean, even with, with ice water. And after it was done, after Brittany, you know, had, had you know, gotten me cooled off, I, I just went to sleep. Like, I mean, I had no energy. I had, it was all drained from me. And yeah. it, and it kind of reminded me of, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Jacob's Ladder. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, remember the, the, the part where, like, he gets, like, this crazy fever and, like, they end up having to throw him in a, in a you know, a tub full of ice? Yeah, like, scarlet fever. Yeah, like, now, I don't think I had a fever and I would have died, but, like, that's what it reminds me of, right? It was just this really sudden, uh, like, yeah, I, may... yeah like, it, it was freaky oh. anyway. But, I mean, compared to your story, <laughs> you know, it's, it's... Well, the way I see it, every everybody's experience is... Uh... No, everybody, everybody has their experiences. Not one is worse than the other. Maybe you might look things differently or you might want to, you might be grateful that it's not your experience, but I always, I always look at it as not, there's not one that's better or worse than, than the other. Well, they're all experiences and they're fun to, well, it's not that they're just fun to discuss, especially when you're, when you're interested in it, but I mean, it, it's, it's good to know, I guess, you know, I mean, all of these stories gives us all different perspectives on exactly on these things. So, you know, so what happened after, you know, I mean, he, he got the name, I guess he used the name to call out the demon. Uh, once, once the demon gave its name, yeah, uh, he began, is when he began to call it out, to cast it out and from there the chair started the chair started shaking like very violently as more ob you know like more objects begin to just kind of rattle and fall off of stuff but the but the apartment stayed still just everything else didn't while this chair is just fucking violently shaking back and forth it threw it threw Lisa off a few times threw David off and uh, you know, in between, you know, in between trying to cast it out, Darren Childs is telling us, get, you know, hold it, hold it in place, hold it in place. Do not let it levitate. Uh, yeah. He started, he started bleeding. Uh, Leon's body started bleeding from the mouth and from his ears. 
Wow, that's that's freaky. And like his eyes rolled into the back of his head, and and then when I remember when like it, when everything came back when. Uh, there's a part of an exorcism I never heard except for this one when he said no he said the art he said let go of this vessel he shall not he said he shall not hear speak nor see evil and then the screeching stopped and we noticed that the bleeding stopped because Cynthia kept wiping the blood away the bleeding from his ears stopped and his eyes came his eyes rolled back to the to the front of his head they're still very empty and cold but then just uh, uh, at the, he kept calling out when he finally said he was casting it out. Everything kind of stopped for a little bit. And we kept we kept on praying. He had no screech. And uh, the, once again, the chair started shaking and Leon's body is like stiffening up. And then it stopped again. And Darren made us take, Darren made us kind of, take another break not one where we could like two of us got to stay with him go leave the room like gave it a moment and he said wipe off his head get a get a wet rag on him right now wipe off his head he kept throwing the holy water kept on praying and was like making this pour water down darren's throat and he went for the he went for the third time we we were probably probably about 45 minutes later and he says the vessel needs one more. He's like the vessel's just needing another break from this. Just let. He's like just let me recuperate for a moment, and then to the final, to the final cast out. When there wasn't much anymore fighting until he stiffened up and like started to like gag, like made this god awful gagging noise. And his eyes rolling, rolling around again. The chair shaking, and uh, Leon evacuated his bowels. <laughs> That it was noticeable, but yeah, he just he was like having a seizure while strapped into this chair, and then the whole room just kind of felt very, very hot, as if things went dark. And then we noticed that that the cross he had drawn in the chalk started to like dissipate and like as if it was being erased, as this very hot flash hit the room. And the seizure suddenly stopped. And then Darren spent another 20 minutes. This is the scariest part. Like the other, the other scariest part for me is when he started telling Leon to come back. He said, come back to us. Your best, you come back, come back and occupy your vessel once again. So, unless it's being shared. So like he didn't know if, if the demon was still in it. It was as if he had casted out the demon and sent it back. And it was just like an empty, dead vessel. As if Leon's soul was hiding and he got, and he was saying, Leon, come back, come back to us. And, and about, about 10 to 20 minutes later, Suddenly, Leon kind of started gagging and gasping, and well, and Darren said, "Take him to the hospital." He said, "Just take him to the hospital. Just talk to him." But Leon was back. Leon was definitely back. So, you, and hmm? you guys must have, you know, rushed him to the hospital. I mean, uh, you know what? What? Uh, the da uh, David. David, Cynthia, and Lisa took him to the hospital uh, in David's car. I was in so much shock because I'd never seen any of this. And the other thing that had me was all the drawings, the scratches had had like were like burned. Wow! Like all the scratch, like all the scratches that were made into the into the table had burn marks around them. The drawings, the journal entries were like like burned up. Yeah, that's pretty freaky. And I and I asked Darren, "Is this the last we've seen of him?" He said, "We'll hope so." He said, "I'll be back to check on him." He said, "We've gotten through the worst of it, but he's still very susceptible. It could still be here." 
uh, what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm going to bless this house and I'll be back. Mm. He was very vague when I said, when? He goes, in time. I'll be back in time. I'd be pretty concerned that it was it was around it could jump into me. You know, that that's you know, if if I were there, right? Oh yeah. You you believe me, that thought went through my head. That's because I said, What do I gotta do so that they don't have to do a so my people don't have to do a well, like have to do a ritual to bring my soul back. And he just said just he said, just pray to your deity. He said, I'm not judging of you. Just pray to your deity or your deities. So whatever whatever it is you fancy, he said, just ask for the protection and make sure you just tell it that you're too strong. Okay. So what what came of, uh, you know, when they brought Leon to the hospital? Um, what did the doctor find? What was his opinion? Uh, the, doc- the doctor was a little bit baffled but said he was – uh, severely hydrated or dehydrated. I'm sorry. Uh, he was very severely dehydrated, and that uh, it looked like he'd been through some kind of trauma, but they couldn't place where. They kept him for they kept him for a couple of days, you know, like on IVs and observation. And then they, uh, when he said he couldn't remember what happened, they say he should go see a counselor. And yeah, you know, and get you know go to therapy to, for the amnesia. And we told him what we had told him what had happened, and said that you know you had, you'd been possessed. Cynthia here found the minister who could, who doesn't act on behalf of the church, to take care of this for you. So if you ever meet this guy Leon, you, like you better count your lucky stars and. He was very apologetic for the things that were being said, and we're like, "It's not you." And I'd asked him, "Were you in there at all?" He said, I, "He said I, I was, but I felt so distant from the world." So it was like he was a, he was a, a another observer in his own body. Exactly. Did he Did ever like- gain any of his uh, memories back from that time? Uh, when we had when we had asked, he had said the only thing, a lot of things he could remember, was just a lot of the nasty things that were being said. So was that it? Like, did did uh, David actually get this out? Like, was it gone? Uh, when Darren came, uh, when when Minister Darren Childs came back, uh, Darren, Darren had said that remnants of it still lingered and he did a blessing of the house and then uh the like the last thing i can remember the last thing yeah, i remember in any experience with darren was after he had suggested leon move he looked at cynthia and said you need to come see me now oh uh, and him and cynthia left together and lisa went with them not sure what happened with all that because Cynthia won't talk about it. But Leon, Leon had monthly visits from Darren for the next six months. Wow! Just to perform blessings of the of his new apartment himself, and ever so often to make sure that nothing came back. And then I never saw Darren again, but I can never forget. The things flying at me, the screeching, the the personal shots that were taken at me. And like this thing was just looking to hurt our feelings and turn everybody on each other. And I guess you'll, I learned, hmm? you'll always be kind of curious too, I guess, of that thing that Cynthia won't speak of. I have an idea. I have an idea. Because I'd asked Lisa, did she go through the same things Leon did? All these would tell me it's from one degree or another, but nothing. She said nothing that she wants me to talk to you about. Mm. Uh, so I can I respect that, but I have an idea. I think, I think it latched onto Cynthia. That that's what I got from that little tidbit that you said there too. 
Because it, so, it was just, it, it was what that's... kind of an effect did this have on your own personal beliefs? I guess afterward, um, you know, coming away from the experience in the months later, having to think about the things that you've witnessed, um, I'm sure it kind of changed your perspective on some things. Uh, like like I mentioned earlier, I began to believe in hell. At that time, I hadn't really believed there was an underworld. You know, just that there are things placed here. You know, since angels and demons is like the biggest contradiction ever because they're the same damn thing. Just there's bad and good. But I started to believe that there has that there is a hell because if everything's on earth and there's a heaven, then why are there evil things here that want you know that want to take us out and make it their own or take us with them? So I began to believe in a hell. I knew that there had to be an underworld and that anybody, anybody is susceptible to a possession. And now I'm actually, I believe I'm extra susceptible since one demon, you know, one demon figured out I can, you can get under my skin. I thought I was just have to stay spiritually strong. If you're spiritually strong, you stand a better chance of fighting it off yourself. Regardless of what that spirituality may be. Exactly. Re regardless of faith, regardless of beliefs, uh, or anything like that, as long as you believe in something and believe that someone is, is always with you to protect you, and that's only half the battle. You have to know in not just your mind and your heart, but you have to know within your soul that you're strong that you're strong enough that it can't because if you believe, you know, well, I'm not strong enough to fight this off. You're going to get, you're going to get the possession and you're going to do things that aren't like you. If you believe you're possessed, find somebody immediately to find out. Well, what it reminds me of, I mean, just the concept of whatever your faith is, if you believe it, you know, and th and this really is a, a much broader topic for another another day. But um, you know, it's, it's just like people who believe in miracles. You know, everybody who you know believes in an idea and has faith in it, it often will come true regardless of your faith or belief system. Um, I mean, even magicians used used to use that trick of you know they believe that they would have money come in, and there's people who have done it for like years where they would focus and believe that they would get money and they would regularly get checks that weren't, you know, they, they couldn't really account for, you know, why they would get the amounts they got or where it came from and stuff like that. So I guess the moral of the story is that really your own brain, if I mean, if you can believe and you can have faith in an idea, regardless of your stance on things, if you truly believe it, you will impact the outcome of events. Exactly. Um, so a saying that I always have that i that I coined myself. Um, I've always said that uh, that faith is the action. To believe is a state of mind. Yeah, there you go. But yeah, you know, there's now. I I even want to give you a follow up, kind of what happened to everybody after this very eerie event took place. I mean, I know the people listening were probably a little disappointed that didn't get you know more details. But you know, I told what there's to tell. There's not. You know, like the drawings, I don't really need to get into descriptions. They were drawings of demons, if you really want to know. But uh, in the time since the exorcism, again, Minister Darren Childs, he disappeared after he told Cynthia so suddenly, I need to, you and I, I need to see you right now. And they, they left together with Lisa uh, at, shortly after that. You know, I didn't see him anymore. And last I heard, his daughter died and he disappeared. And I told you guys earlier, David left the church, and uh, he now he's now you know a very uh, you know a very happy pagan and performs rituals and weddings. Uh, Cynthia now resides uh, up near one of the border near the border of Canada uh, in northern in northern Minnesota. At least that's what she told that's what she told me. I'm still not sure where all the states and where they are. You guys know better than I do. Uh, I'm if pretty Minnesota bad at geography. 
<laughs> I'm very bad at geography. Yeah, that she says she's Borders, Canada, where she lives up there in Minnesota. Uh, she lives with her, she lives with her wife and their adopted kids. Uh, Lisa, I lost track of Lisa when she left for med school. As for uh, Leon, he, you know, I spent a couple. He spent a good couple of years. Yeah, you know, just trying to move on with his life, though. Um, unfortunately, uh, after after his newborn died after childbirth, and the mother of the child kind of shunned him. Uh, he was found by his brother. Uh, he had left a note, and he had driven his car off the mountain. Shit. Well, I can, uh, you know, I, I can relate to how hard it is to know people who've committed suicide. I've I've known a couple in my lifetime. So have I. Yeah, not a not a good, uh, you know, it, it's always a shocking. I mean, uh, I I still can't like. I mean, if if I, if I think about it, it actually still gets to me. So I I can yeah. understand where you're coming from with that. Well. Uh. The, the, hard, the hardest part was that when we, when we weren't hearing from him, uh, when me and David went to his place, I found the note. And just the, there's one part in that note that really just kind of got to me. He said, it was when he said, I, I don't belong with the mortal coil anymore. It looks like that demon came back and finished his job, didn't he? Yeah, that is. Uh, that was the hardest part of that note, and again, it uh, underlies the dangers when um, playing with these kinds of things. You know, even even when things <coughs> uh, uh, seemingly end our way, uh, you know, in the end, sometimes you know we lose anyway. Yeah, uh, it just it made me it made me stronger and really, you know. Uh, it had been a long time since I had dealt with somebody killing themselves. It was just going through that such a, I guess, I, for lack of a better word, intimate experience with him. You know, I uh, didn't think things like that would happen. Uh, you know, it gave me a better, more of an appreciation for life. And as for our investigation team, we never did another one as a team. I've done, I've done more paranormal investigations. Just I always have the rule that find out when it started and what started it. And if I tell you, if I tell you, don't antagonize it. Please listen to me, or I will walk out on the investigation. And you know, and I think. It, it, sorry, go on. I'm uh, saying, and I did. Uh, after that, I walked out on four different investigations. I think it's important, to, uh, you know, to note because I mean, uh, a lot of people that that listen to our channel, you know. If you're interested in this stuff, you probably have had inter interest or have actually done your own kind of, uh, you know, investigations, whether small or big or, you know, w whatever scale. Uh, you know, it, it, being someone who's interested and who've done my own poking around, uh, it's, it's very easy to get excited um, when you think you, you have something, you know, that you're, you're seeing something like that. But as you can tell from this story... Uh, among many others is you never ever provoke or get careless or you know it's easy to do that or, or to or to uh do things that you think would be minor like invite things to to you know if, once you open that invitation once you open that door it's it's open it's, well you just don't want to ever take for granted with what you're dealing with no, but another good another good example is the uh those guys on ghost adventures you know gay zach and his friends yeah. Uh, no, notice there another good example right there when Aaron had Aaron had said that they all had that one investigation with the demon. Zach wouldn't stop provoking it, and it followed him home and ruined Aaron's life, ruined his marriage. Um, Zach's never been the same. The other guy, uh, things got ruined for him because it latched onto him and it followed him, and now Zach's known for getting possessed. Yeah, so I mean, it's just again another example of, you know, have respect for what you're dealing with. You know, I mean, that's a big part. Respect what you're dealing with. Be cautious, 
and uh, you know, just don't let the the excitement of you know what could be a, an interesting experience throw your judgment out the window. Exactly. Right? Always, you know, always thank them for their time too. You know, thank them for their time, and if if you get that EVP and it says leave me alone or go away or asking you why you're bothering it, you're done. Yeah, exactly. Leave it, leave it where it is, right? Re- respect it for what it is. So and if you get, if you get, yeah, you get the three scratches, you're done. Don't provoke it. Otherwise shit like this happens. Yeah. I, th- I think once you, you figure you're dealing with a demon, you should just be done anyway. I mean, that's just one thing, you know, speaking with a, with a ghost or, or, you know, that kind of entity is, is very different from a demon. I mean, they're very strong spiritually, um, period, right? I mean, it's really not something that uh, we should take on. Period. No, you should, because uh, the initial, I always, the, what I've always noticed in my research, the initial three scratches are a warning. That's yeah. your first warning. This is what I am. Shh, do you, we really need to continue this? Just let me do what. Just let me do my bidding. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. You get you get the sense of something like that. Leave it alone. Uh, the only time where I would even advise your presence in something like that would be in a case such as yours, where it's your friend or something like that, and you're trying to help. Yeah. You know. Other than that. Uh, you know, I mean, it's really not something you should do for fun. So uh, with that having been said, you know, once again, Chad, thanks for coming on and uh, sharing a, another. You, got, you guys are. Well, another great story. I was, <laughs> was going to say, you know, um, yeah. just like before, oh. um, uh, it was a great story. And I think that it will resonate with people. And I think there's, there's, Definitely. there's, you know, uh, knowledge, <laughs> you know, worthy knowledge for people who, you know, are interested in this stuff and, and kind of do their own little investigations. Like this stuff is, is good knowledge, you know, of why not to do certain things or, you know what I mean? Like it, it's exactly. And I'll kind of leave, I'll kind of leave them with, with this. Just remember there are things that, that knock back. They're watching us. We don't, we're not, we're not the only ones in this realm. We share it. We share our, our domiciles. If you're that uncomfortable move, if you can't move, get your house blessed it'll move on and attach itself to someone else's house don't don't provoke if you don't think you should if you gotta second guess it then it means don't do it and always always be grateful for who you have around you because this may happen you don't see them again yes listen to your little man you know the (laughs) (laughs) exactly and I want to thank you guys for having me on again. I definitely hope you on in the future to share, you know, share more stories with you guys when you get back. When you want to get back to a more paranormal, like more, more paranormal ghost encounters or oh yeah, or for UFO sure encounters. Because I I like your idea for your next podcast. Uh, with what you said about that fever you got, maybe you should be on your own podcast next show, Will. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I can fill a podcast with it, but I, well, well, you, know. you should be one of, one of the guests on it because it sounds like that's exactly what you were doing right there. That was your trigger word, but of course, oh, that's for your God, next podcast, yeah. and I'll be listen. I'll be listening to it. Yeah, I'll be. I'll be very interested to hear anyone who's you know if you if if we get people to kind of participate. But I mean, if if you listen to this stuff going to sleep, listen to our playlist of our shows. Kind of let the the trigger words float around and just see what we get. I'd be very interested. I mean, who knows? We could get someone on here that you know had this crazy experience, never even knew he had it, kind of hidden in his subconscious somewhere. Uh, we could end up with with you know a, a show that's just as revealing to us as it is for the person who has you know the flashback, right? Um, exactly. I hope to hear some. I hope to get you guys get one of somebody that's encountered Bigfoot. That would be cool. Geez, almost anything would be cool in a paranormal. Being, being a fan of it, I mean, there's no shortage of <laughs> really, oh, really def- cool stuff, right? Oh, definitely. And I'm kind of a, I kind of study to be a jack of all trades with the, with the paranormal. You know, I believe in a lot of it. Uh, I do hope to eventually encounter Bigfoot. Yeah, and that's a that's a podcast that we definitely do have to have at some point. Is a is a a Bigfoot one. I know that it's one that Ryan has. You know, Ryan's a huge Bigfoot 
fan. I mean, that's true, right, Ryan? I'm not lying. Oh, there. very, very much, very much. Cryptids, cryptids in general. Um, so, I mean, for <clears throat> for any of you out there who have uh, any effed up stories of your own, uh, cryptids, uh, premonitions, ghost experiences, MIB, anything along those lines, uh, you know, please go to our official website, www fedupstories.com uh go to submissions uh it's really easy to fill out you don't have to register or do anything stupid uh and you don't even have to leave your own name if you don't want to um, <laughs> yeah yeah i learned <laughs> don't buy any it don't don't purchase anything and will might be able to change your username <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's right um I, I i had to change your name for you see what what we got done is is for buying stuff on the site i have it rigged up so it's tied to your account kind of like steam um if for anyone who plays computer games and you buy something that's tied to your account so yeah you, you can sign in anywhere and anything you ever bought is in a list of your stuff um so that's why i have it done that way but if you need your your name changed and you, you haven't bought anything yet it's pretty easy for me to do it it gets a little bit complicated afterwards but you know it can be done <laughs> but anyways guys uh thanks chad for coming on i mean uh, uh Oh, definitely. I hope to be on again down the road. You know, let's oh, give someone sure. else a spot. I like, let's give someone else a spotlight for a few shows, right? <laughs> for sure, man. But yeah, any any time you feel like uh, shooting us some new stories, stuff like that. I mean, we always got a backlog of stuff. I mean, it, it's not that we don't have the material; it's, it's that we don't have a lot of time to you get it together. I know everybody says we they wish it was a weekly thing, and we wish we could do it weekly. And if we didn't have regular jobs and wives and cats who meow all night uh you know right. <laughs> we'd be able to do it but uh you know so there's no shortage of, of content we'll have lots of content we'll have more content and uh, hopefully we'll have you back on the show in the future chad uh for everyone oh, listening definitely. for everyone listening thank you and we'll catch you next time this is will signing out uh thank you again chad and uh again every, everybody out there listening um i'm ryan sharp Good night. Blessed be.